Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The words, a little while, they saturate today's gospel lesson. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he tells his disciples, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. And the disciples ask amongst themselves, what is he talking about? We don't know what he is saying, and it makes sense that they wouldn't know what he's talking about. After all, when Jesus used very plain speech with them about his death and his resurrection, they didn't understand that. When he told them very bluntly that the Son of Man must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day, they were unable to understand that. And that was a definite period of time be raised on the third day. And so it's understandable that they wouldn't be able to understand Jesus when he uses indefinite language like this. A little while, and you will not see me. A little while again, and you will see me. And let alone the reason for his absence, because I go to the Father, he says. The disciples are asking amongst themselves what he's talking about, and Jesus, being the good shepherd of souls that he is, who leads and guides his sheep into a better understanding, knows that they are confused by this, and so he explains this little while business to them. He explains it to them by means of a parable. He says at first, Most assuredly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. From these words, it's clear that Jesus is going to leave them for a little while, but Jesus doesn't at this point explain how he's going to leave them, how it's possible that they won't see him. Nor does he explain just what he means by a little while. Instead, he tells them about how they will experience that little while and how the world will experience that little while as well, that Jesus is gone. The disciples, they weep. They will lament. They will have sorrow and mourning. Their teacher and Lord, after all, is going to depart. And so, of course, they'll weep and lament. The one that they have confessed to be Christ, the Son of the living God, the one whom they have confessed has the words of eternal life, is leaving them for a little while. And that they will weep and lament then indicates that this is going to be a painful separation. And then to add insult to injury, the world is going to rejoice for the specific same reason while the, why the disciples are sorrowful. <clears throat> and so as if their own sorrow and loss at their Lord isn't enough, they're going to feel the oppressive gloating of the world, rejoicing in the very thing that brings them sorrow. Their only comfort during that little while will be Jesus' word that he gives them. No earthly support, no worldly comfort, no consolation except the word that Jesus had spoken to them. Their only comfort and consolation will be that promise, your sorrow will be turned to joy. It won't last forever. It will last only as long as they are unable to see Jesus, because again a little while and they will see him. And when he returns, then there will be rejoicing. There will be in the words of our psalm this morning, making a joyful shout to God. They will sing out the honor of his name. They will make his praise glorious. The comfort, their comfort during that little while of suffering is that it will only last a little while. And after it is true joy. He elaborates on this by means of a parable. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. The disciple's experience is likened to that of a pregnant woman who is in labor. The time has come to deliver. And when labor pains come upon a woman, there is, from what I understand, sorrow, anxiety, apprehension, not only at the physical pain that is about to be suffered, but also anxiety and apprehension for the life of the child. And her labor lasts, not forever, but only a little while. 
an indefinite period of time. But once that child is delivered, once that baby is here, then there is joy and all of the anguish is forgotten. And joy, the fact that a child has been born into the world. And so just as the woman in labor has sorrow and affliction and apprehension during that little while of labor, but then all of that evaporates into the joy once the child arrives, so it will be for the apostles. Therefore, he says, you will, have, you will now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. So when is this little while that Jesus is speaking of? When he won't be present with his disciples? When they won't see him? When he goes to the Father? Well, he says this to them on Monday, Thursday. He is about to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. He is about to be beaten. He is about to be tortured. He is about to be put to death for the sins of the world. He goes to his father through his death, for he says as he dies, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the world rejoices as he goes to his father. The world hates Jesus. He says in John 7, verse 7, the world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. And so when Jesus is put to death, the world rejoices because now the voice that has been condemning its works and its unbelief is finally silenced. The disciples, however, sorrow. But when they have been convinced that Christ is risen from the dead, then they have joy. They rejoice. And that joy, no one can take from them. The little while is also then that time between Christ's ascension and his return on the last day to judge the quick and the dead. Once Christ Jesus ascends, the disciples no longer see him. And not only do the disciples no longer see him, but you and me, no one sees him physically, with the exception of St. Paul, of course. Everyone who is blessed because they believe without seeing, does not see Jesus as well. Jesus, though, is with his church always, even to the end of the age, through his Holy Spirit, as he promised. He is with his church bodily in his sacrament of his body and blood, again, just as he promised. But still, during this little while, we mourn, we lament, and we wait eagerly for the day when every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him. For you, and me, and the entire church, we are in the little while, the time in which there is much sorrow. I don't have to tell you that, though. We have the sorrows that are common to mankind, that are common to unbelievers as well, the common afflictions of life in this world. But as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, we sorrow over things that unbelievers don't sorrow. We sorrow over the perversity of our world. We lament our society's rapid descent into decay. We sorrow over the state of Christ's church, how few they are within his fold. We lament our sinful flesh, that though we delight in God's law in our inner man, we see another law at work in our flesh, the law of sin, which is daily tempting and inciting and seducing us into false belief and despair and other great shame and vice. In this world, this veil of tears, this valley of the shadow of death, we have the devil, we have the world, we have our own flesh as enemies, and sorrowing over the course over these enemies, we say with David in the 13th Psalm, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? And the Lord's answer for how long is a little while. A little while, but with the promise that with the sorrow comes joy. A joy that the world will not be able to take. For after a little while, that sorrow will be turned to joy. The joy that Jesus gives now is the joy which he gave to his apostles at his resurrection. It is the joy of his death and resurrection, the joy of peace, of conscience, because sins are forgiven, covered not with excuses, not with self-justifications, 
but with the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from all sins. It is the joy of knowing that as Christ has gone to the Father to prepare a place for those who believe in him, so he will also return to take us to himself, so that where he is, there we may be also. It is the joy of knowing that even though now we live in this corruptible body of death, which daily tempts us and entices and seduces us, we know and are joyful at the fact that we will be raised on the last day with bodies like unto our Lord Jesus, incorruptible, glorified, completely animated with the Holy Spirit. We face the sorrows of life, hopeful, cheerful, and undaunted, as we sang in our hymn, letting none of our enemies overcome us because we trust Christ's mercy, because we rejoice in his salvation, because we confess that although in this world we do have mourning and weeping and lamentation, our Lord Jesus Christ deals bountifully with us in his gospel. He gives us joy because he gives us the fruit of his death and resurrection. And he promises perfect, complete, eternal joy when he returns at the end, after this little while has passed. And since we live in this little while, between his ascension and his return, we not only live inwardly in this joy, but we live outwardly in this joy as well. St. Peter talks about this in today's epistle lesson. He calls Christian sojourners and pilgrims, that is, we're temporary residents, we're, we're passing through this world in which the devil rules and sin holds sway. We are sojourners, we are pilgrims in this world, because like our father Abraham, we desire a better that is a heavenly country, the home of God's elect. And since we look forward to that heavenly country, we abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, as he writes. Where those fleshly lusts, whether for, they're for pleasure or popularity, whether they're for financial gain or glory, all of them wage war against our souls. All of them wage war against us to take us into captivity once again to sin, to conquer us, so that we come once again to prefer the passing pleasures of this world and prefer this sinful country rather than our heavenly homeland of eternal bliss. To fall to this would be to choose the fleeting flesh pots of Egypt and to forfeit the promised land of everlasting bliss instead. So Peter tells us to abstain from these lusts because they wage war against you. Therefore, by the gospel, wage war against them. Not only do you abstain from these living in the gospel, he says, but we live as temporary residents here, submitting ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, to put to silence those foolish men who, when they see the bad behavior of Christians, they use it as an argument against the faith. And if, in pursuing God's will, we suffer for it, and, as Paul says, all who, want to, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution, then we bear that patiently as well. Because suffering for doing what is good is commendable to God, he says. Like the Judean exiles in Babylon, we are to seek the peace of this place where God has put us, meaning we work for the betterment of our communities and for its improvement as God has placed us here. But... We see all things as those who are passing through this little while on the way to our heavenly homeland, abstaining from the lusts of the flesh of this world, conducting ourselves honorably so that others may see our good works, the good works that our faith produces, and if not in this day, then on the last day glorify God. And so, dear saints of God through faith in Christ Jesus, whether in the midst of hardships and afflictions, or crosses and persecutions, we live by faith in the word that Jesus has given us. We live in the joy of the resurrection, knowing that now in this life we will experience suffering and sorrow and lamentation, but all of it lasts but a little while. For we will see our Lord Jesus Christ again when he returns to judge the living and the dead. 
And on that day, the joy that he gives us now, the joy that we have by faith, will be complete and perfect. And no one will take it from us. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. We sing the offer.